Christ is risen. Welcome, dear friends of the Byzantine Catholic Seminary of St. Cyril and Methodius, which is an accredited school of theology that forms leaders for the Church who continue the mission mandate of our Lord Jesus Christ to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that the Lord has commanded us, in order that we may have the light of life. As the academic dean of the seminary, I, Father Christian Kappas wish to welcome you to our 24th annual lecture on behalf of our Metropolitan Archbishop, William Skirla, the president of the Byzantine Catholic Seminary, along with his board, our new rector, Father Ron Baruszewski, our staff, faculty, and the student body. Pope John Paul II once referred to our patrons, Cyril and Methodius, as authentic precursors of ecumenism. Fittingly, this lecture series provides a platform for scholarly and ecumenical discussion, especially between Orthodox and Catholic scholars, while strengthening and unifying spiritual bonds between people of faith. As we endeavor to hand on the tradition of the Christian East, we expect that our graduates will enrich the life of the church and engage the world in theological reflection, dialogue, and witness. Looking with hope toward the future, service in the church as leaders, ministers, and scholars St. Cyril and Methodius Seminary is pleased to announce 10 graduates this year. And on a personal note, I might add, it is our largest graduating class during my decade of service as Dean of our seminary. The following students have completed all requirements for the granting of their diplomas. In the Master of Divinity, Deacon Thomas Patrick Donlan, Deacon Nathaniel James Tapsack, Deacon Tyler Edward Wisniewski, all completed their requirements as well as the MA in Theology with its ministerial focus, Deacon Fred Aboud, Deacon Timothy Andrew Kennedy, Deacon Gary Thomas Stafford have all completed their requirements. And finally, in the Masters of Theology, Sabina Dorowski, MD, Sherry Michelle Pujo, and Zachary James Hunter, along with Ryan Patrick Mulvey, have all finished their requirements. Congratulations, all of our graduates. Turning to our lecturer this evening, the very Reverend Dr. John McGuckin. He is an archpriest of the Romanian Orthodox Church. Father McGuckin was ordained to the priesthood with a pastoral care mission for the Romanians in England in 1996. He is married to Aline McGuckin, a professional master iconographer in the Byzantine and Slavic styles. They have three children and seven grandchildren. He has taught as a professor in the theological faculty of Oxford University, been a senior professional research fellow at Emory University School of Law, and taught at St. Irenaeus Orthodox Institute at Red Bood University in Niemingen. He received his Bachelor of Divinity from Heathrop College, a PhD in Patristic Theology from Durham University, postgraduate certificate in education from Newcastle University, a MA in education in curriculum design and educational management from Southampton University and honorary doctorates of divinity from both St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary and the doctor of letters from the Lucian Blaga University in Romania. He founded and directed the New York Sophia Institute as an advanced research forum for Eastern Orthodox thought and culture. His first book was on St. Simeon, the New Theologian, after which he's published over 33 books on religious and historical themes and two volumes of poetry, becoming internationally recognized as a leading interpreter of the early Christian and Eastern Orthodox traditions. The central focus of his research revolves around 4th to 5th century thought in the fathers and especially Byzantine mystical writers. He has most recently prepared a new translation with commentary on St. Simeon the New Theologian's Hymns of Divine Eros, one of the greatest of all medieval Orthodox mystical texts, which is to appear with St. Vladimir's, uh, Vladimir's Seminary Press, New York, in 2024. His works have been translated into many languages, Romanian, Spanish, Russian, Dutch, Korean, and Chinese, among others. Additionally, he has published more than 150 research articles in scholarly journals and has a well-known presence on social media. This evening's talk, is entitled Theological Radicalism in a Time of Political Revolution, the Case of St. Simeon the New Theologian in Constantinople. Father John, 
I am excited for us to learn more about St. Simeon in light of your research and your forthcoming work. Thank you for being present, and please feel free to begin at your leisure. Thank you very much, Father. Um, good evening, Your Eminence, dear fathers, sisters, and brothers. It's a pleasure to be invited to deliver the annual St. Cyril and Methodius lecture to the school. And my talk this evening lasts 43 minutes, I timed it, and has four parts. First of all, a brief context why St. Simeon, a largely unknown Byzantine saint, is significant. Secondly, a brief review of his life and times, so as to position him in a very turbulent historical period. Thirdly, a consideration of some of the main insistences he raises as a theologian of the mystical life, one who identifies mysticism with ordinary Christianity rather than exceptional elitism. And fourth and lastly, a short conclusion how some of this may impact us in the church today. So part one, a brief introductory context. It is often said that Eastern Christian tradition, to which we here today mostly belong, is, quote, one of the world's great unknown treasures. Well, if that is so, within that unknown treasure, since Simeon the New Theologian is one of the most precious of all the unknown jewels in that unknown treasure chest. He is a Christian poet of a caliber who matches, if not surpasses, that of St. John of the Cross and a mystical theologian whose doctrine stands rooted in the earth of the everyday, but which takes it for granted that each believer shall speak to Jesus face to a lumen face before they die. St. Simeon lived for most of his life in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, which was then the capital of the Byzantine Christian Empire. His lifespan, 949 to 1022, parallels that of the emperor whom he was brought up to serve, Basil II, commonly known as Basil the Bulgar Slayer, Bulgaroktonos, a harsh and demanding character whom Simeon, as a very young man, served as an aristocratic eunuch in the heart of the imperial household, a position he first luxuriated in but ended up positively hating before making his escape into monasticism, much to the emperor's annoyance. Simeon was a controversial figure in his time. His works are among the most vivid of the Eastern Christian Church's tradition, with their appeal constantly to direct personal experience. His title, The New Theologian, began in all probability as a denigration from his enemies. As an innovator, his work and person would be held in low esteem in traditional Byzantium. Soon, however, his growing number of disciples turned that to their advantage, elevating him and his work, even though he is not a theologian in the traditional sense of a leading patristic dogmatician, to the rarefied heights of only two others who were given that designation, the Apostle John and St. Gregory of Nazianzus. All of Simeon's life was spent in a highly volatile political period of the empire, when powerful aristocratic clans, including the Anatolian family of Simeon himself, stood in high tension with the central imperial administrations, whom they regarded as a hindrance to their own military and financial power bases on the borders. His life not only stands as a witness to deeply important spiritual teachings, but also on the historical front gives us much interesting information about conditions in the Byzantine Empire during a relatively otherwise unknown period. The saint's spiritual teaching coincides with a time in Byzantine religious life where a new interest in eschatology and pneumatology can be discerned discerned, perhaps something not unexpected in times of political and social anxiety, and also in a church where bureaucracy, 
and a certain establishment tiredness had settled in, where bishops were great and rich men, and church officers were sought after as cosy jobs. In several later modern church history books, particularly by 18th and 19th century Jesuit writers in the main, he is sometimes stated to have been a forefather of the Hesychast movement. This, as you know, was a 14th century development of the earlier patristic materials on spiritual consciousness. Simeon was an original thinker in that spiritual development, but was independent of the later Hesychasts. The mistaken connection was made because in much later times, on Mount Athos, a treatise was wrongly assigned to his name concerning the physical method of hesychastic interior prayer. That work, concerned with imagining the place of the heart in the Jesus prayer and with patterns of breathing, which was so highly prized among the Athenites, but so detested by the Optina Stazzi and Bishop Ignatius Bryantchininov, that work is certainly not by Simeon, nor can certain notable characteristics of the post-14th century hesychastic method be found in his work at all, such as devotion to the Jesus prayer or emphasis on monologistic invocations. Even so, Simeon's light-centred mystical enthusiasm, his deeply heart-centred effect of spirituality built around humility and repentance, and his fundamental stress on the manner in which the consciousness of the presence of God brings illumination and gladness to the heart, all of this laid a path which later writers would develop. In a real but heavily qualified sense, therefore, he may be regarded as a founder of what later, and independent of him, came to be Byzantine hesychasm. This takes us to part two, a short biography. In 949, a baby was born to a family of provincial aristocrats from Galata in Asia Minor, whom his parents called George. Simeon was to be his name after his monastic profession. They were a wealthy clan who had already had several older boys. The father's younger brother, a eunuch from birth, was already serving in the capacity of a high court official in the imperial palace at Constantinople. It was decided to make the new baby also a eunuch, common practice at the time, and place him at the court as he grew up to look out for the family interest there. This is how the child came to serve beside his uncle when he was 11 years old in 960. But only three years later, in 963, there was bloody street fighting all around the capital. The dying emperor, Romanus II, had left a will in his will that the eunuch politician Joseph Bringas should act as the powerful regent for his childhood sons Basil and Constantine Porphyrogenitos, who were then aged six and three years respectively. But that situation was deeply unpopular with the people, who were militarily afraid, and with the young widowed Empress Theophano, who had plans of her own. She arranged it with the senior general, John Zimiskis, that they should induce the greatest of all the Byzantine generals, Nikiforas Phokas, to march upon the capital and seize the throne for himself. Simeon's hagiographer, who writes a generation later and always attempts to remove items of controversy from the story, tells us that at this time, Simeon's aristocratic uncle was, quote, ushered out of life in no ordinary manner. In other words, he was a victim of the palace revolution. We know from later events that Simeon's family were allies of Nikiforas Phokas, and after a very short time after the coup, Simeon reappears again in an elevated social setting. During the rebellion, he seems to have taken temporary refuge at the Studium Monastery, and here he probably first met someone who would later be his mentor, 
the monk Simeon Yulaves. But George, the aristocrat, re-emerged from the monastery soon afterwards when peace was established. An otherwise unknown senator took him onto his staff and our saint attended the palace daily, soon giving the, given the rank of senator and becoming a spatho cubicularius, master of the sword and cape, a high position reserved for eunuchs who attended the domestic affairs of the immediate imperial family. It was at this time that he became a direct member of Prince Basil's circle. In 969, when he was 20, he describes himself as a very rich and somewhat dissolute youth traveling to and from the court on business. Like several other lay aristocrats, he seems to have been loosely attached at this time to the Studite monk Simeon Yulabes, an eccentric and charismatic figure who served as a confessor father to the group. He made visits to the monastery, and the monk gave him spiritual books to read. We know they were Mark the Monk and Diadikos of Fotiki. He gave him a prayer rule for some form of night vigils, he should say, in his own rooms. But Simeon had some form of crisis in that year. He tells us retrospectively that he was in a state of immense anxiety. When we look at the historical chart, 969, of course, was the year when there was another palace coup and John Zemiskis seized the throne for himself. Simeon phrases his troubles in terms of anxiety for his soul. He says that he was overwhelmed by the thought of his sins and searching for a figure who could truly reconcile him to Christ. He goes on to tell us that during his night vigil prayers in his private room, he saw a shining light, and behind that light, an even more radiant brightness. Much later, in his writings, he interpreted that as the spirit of his spiritual father, Simeon Yulabez, standing interceding for him with Christ. Despite this vision, despite that anxiety, the outward circumstances of his aristocratic life did not witness any remarkable change at this time. But that vision, the first of several others that came to him of the light of Christ, seems to have been a decisive moment in his inner spirituality. He places more and more reliance on his spiritual father, Simeon Yulavez, and becomes increasingly disillusioned with the kind of wealthy courtier lifestyle he is leading in the circle of Prince Basil. In the hymns of Divine Eros, he calls it positively wicked decadence. Years later, when he has emerged himself as a spiritual master, he locates his whole experience of his spiritual father's critical mediatory role on the basis of that original visionary experience of Simeon Yulabe's intercession for him with Christ. His own conception of the transmission of the Christian faith becomes based upon that prophetic model of intercession. He notably describes it as a golden chain of saints leading into this present generation. It was seven years after that first vision, in the year 976, when he was 27, that yet another palace coup initiated a sequence of events that did change his life permanently. The Parakomimonos Basil, the chief uh, administrator of the empire, seized the throne again violently on behalf of the child princes Basil II and Constantine Pyrophoragenitos. And this time, Simeon's family seemed to have been clearly marked by the new power as hostile elements. His own political career was definitively terminated at that point, and he seems himself to have taken another temporary refuge with his spiritual father, Simeon, at the Studite Monastery. He tells us that at this time he once again experienced an overwhelming vision of the light of Christ, but this time, notably, he says, 
he saw the radiance of Christ directly. And this personal event became for him a definitive conversion point. That moment marks his definitive flight from the court and his entrance into the monastic state. That was a move that angered his family and left him in very bad grace with the palace. He himself describes it as the exodus from Egypt. But if he had wanted to join Simeon the Elder in the studium, it seems that the studium did not want him. So in a very short time, we find that he is moved to a nearby smaller monastic house of St. Mamas at the Xilokirkos gate. He parses this in terms of a monastic conversion. But the reality is that he bought the monastery outright as a wealthy man and entered into it as a protected lay regent. He was safe there from imperial power. It was only three years later, between 979 and 980, on the death of the old abbot of St. Mamas, that Simeon himself was elected abbot and the patriarch, Antony the Studite, who was one of his mentors, ordained him as hero monk. Then Simeon set about substantially to refurbish the site of the old monastery. It was at this time he began to deliver a series of traditional morning catechesis to the monks of his community, and they have survived as the largest central body of his writings. There were more than 30 monks in that house, making it a significant household in terms of size. Much of his approach in the catechesis that he gave is traditional studite observance, but much of the original verve that also characterizes his writings and discourses emanates from what he had learned personally from Simeon the Studite. So, for example, he places an extreme stress on the necessity of personal, dedicated obedience that he expects the spiritual father should be given by his monks. He stresses the necessity for direct personal experience in the spiritual life. He lays an immense influence, emphasis on the need for tears, even insisting that without preparatory tears, a monk should never approach the Eucharist. Now that dramatic underlining of the traditional allegiance that the older monastic uh, discipline had expected neophytes novices should give their spiritual fathers, but now its reclaiming in the hands of the abbot of St. Mamas led to serious disruptions within his community, who frankly regarded him as an inexperienced newcomer. In 986, society was disrupted by another aristocratic attempt to topple the throne, this time under Bardas Phokas, once more, the rebellion drew support from aristocrats in Asia Minor, Simeon's homeland. In 986, therefore, the Emperor Basil II dismissed his regent and assumed total power himself. After defeating Phocas in 989, Basil turned to move against his enemies on the domestic front, among whom he seems to have numbered Simeon. In the same period, 986 to 987, the old monk Simeon Yulavez died at the studium, leaving our Simeon as the new head and leader of his old school of disciples, a circle that included both monastics and very wealthy aristocrats. Sometime between 995 and 998, the growing opposition to Simeon's discipline in his own monastery and opposition to his teaching broke out in the form of a revolt by a large number of his community. They threatened him at the morning service and ran off to lodge an official complaint against him at the patriarchal court. His hagiographer attempts to minimise the significance of this event, but a more historicist reading might interpret this as clear evidence that while the Patriarch did not carry out any sentence after that charge, 
there nevertheless remained a determined focus of opposition to Simeon's rule as an abbot right up to the time of his deposition and exile orchestrated by the palace. The rebellion of his monks possibly coincides with the death of the patriarch Nicholas Chrysoberges and the installation of the first patriarchal appointment of Basil II himself, Patriarch Sicinius, 995-998. to Sicinius was succeeded by Sergius II Manuelites, 999-1019, to and his court instituted direct legal proceedings against Simeon, Manuelites Sinculus, or Synodical Chancellor, was the Metropolitan of Nicomedia called Stephen of Alexina. He was a long-time, close, personal friend and protege of the Emperor Basil. These processes aimed against Simeon were more vigorously pursued at this period and eventually resulted in his exile, orchestrated by Bishop Stephen on behalf of of the emperor. The first formal trial turned around the issue that he had unofficially started a cult of his master in memory of Simeon Ulaves. The elder's reputation was attacked in an attempt to discredit the younger Simeon, and after 995, the veneration of the elder Simeon's icon was explicitly forbidden at the St. Mamas house. The hagiographer tries to make out that this opposition was really not from the patriarch nor from the emperor, but rather solely the result of the deep uh, envy and jealousy of Bishop Stephen of Alexina. It is a standard hagiographical ploy, but the attempt to distance Simeon from official levels of censure is unconvincing. Stephen was not only the patriarchal chancellor, was a close friend of the emperor and had been used by him in many uh, political sensitive missions. So even though the hagiographer Nikitas does not want to say this in his writing of the Vita of Simeon, because it was uh, issued on the occasion of bringing or trying to bring Simeon's relics back into the imperial city, it is nevertheless clear enough that the emperor deliberately moved against Simeon using the ecclesiastical court process. In 1003, a second attempt was made against him, since the first had backfired, by means of entangling him in a formal theological debate concerning Trinitarian orthodoxy. This summons produced as his response the book of the theological chapters, where he refuses, simply refuses, to allow anyone the right to theologize, who lacks personal experience of the Spirit of God. He satisfactorily answered the Trinitarian charges against him, but also spent most of the time taking the opportunity to lambast Stephen of Alexina as a rich pseudo-theologian. This was tantamount to a declaration of war instead of the expected sign that, that he would have uh, remained quiet, perhaps rolled over and gone home after receiving these initial warnings. And so the palace initiated a war of attrition against him that carried on for six further years. It ultimately resulted in a synodical sentence of deposition in 1005, with immediately the emperor adding civil house arrest, confiscation of goods and exile. They spent three years uh, keeping him in house arrest, looking for wherever he held the cash, but they couldn't find it. The hagiographer describes all of this as being caused by Simeon's defence of the holy icons, as if it were revisiting the ninth century iconodule heroes. But the real causes were more personal and immediate. Simeon himself certainly regarded the issue uh, taken against him as doctrinally based and localised not in his defence of the icons or anything to do with his Trinitarian theology, but rather an attack on him because he claimed the right 
to insist that a saint can be alive in this present generation, and if so, must judge entirely in accordance with his own God-given lights. We might extend the definition of what doctrinal means at this point in order to note that in this argument, which is almost synonymous with Simeon's central theological thrust to argue that only the initiated mystic has the right to theologize, that the central matter, of course, is one of authority. Where is it located in the church? This struggle to assert the proper locus of authority, be it in the imperially controlled circuit of palace and patriarchal throne, or in the more diffused and independent networks of aristocratic relations and spiritual elders, the issue was critically important, not merely on the theological front proper, but also in the wider context of Basil II's determined efforts to assert his predominance over and against aristocratic clan groups of all kinds. On January the 3rd, 1009, Simeon was exiled to Palukitan near Chrysopolis, opposite, but certainly closed out from, Byzantium. He was soon able to begin again, for his inner circle of disciples, many accompanied him into exile, and one of the wealthy aristocrats among the wider group immediately supplied the money to buy the oratory of St. Marina for him and other lands belonging to other convents. Here in exile, Simeon wrote some of his most famous works, including the exquisite hymns of Divine Eros, which are a rhapsodic classic of Byzantine religious writing. These poems alone mark him out as one of Christianity's leading mystics. My own new translation and commentary on the hymns is appearing later this year with SVS Press in New York, and I hope you will put it on your to-read list. In his final years, we are told of his journeys to family estates back in Asia Minor, his power base. On one of his journeys, he was worn out by an attack of dysentery, and it's said that he died at the age of 73 back in his monastery in Chrysopolis. His relics were preserved in his church, but could not be brought back into the capital. Uh, such was the enduring controversy until that fateful year of 1054, more than 30 years after his death. His hagiographer, Nikitas Stethatos, uh, wrote the Vita of the Saint partly in order to prepare for the reception of the relics in the city. No trace remains today of the saint's monastery or of his relics. Part 3. The Significance of Simeon's Main Teachings Simeon was subsequently received as a great master of the inner life by the Athenite monks, one of the only places that his writings survived physically, and his reputation was championed there as a hesychastic master. In recent decades, he has attracted a lot of European scholarly attention. His teaching is important and significant, both for the historic light it throws on a difficult and dark period of Byzantine affairs, but more so for the spiritual and mystical themes it treats with such freshness and authority. Let us lift out a few of those master themes and consider them to conclude this review of a saint who ought to be far better known than he is. His monastic writings, the catechesis, the ethical discourses, and the theological and practical chapters are the most extensive body of his work. Throughout them all, Simeon tries to support the ongoing studite reform of monasticism that was present in his own day. The Studium Monastery Rule, or Typicon, founded much earlier by St. Theodore Studite of the 8th to 9th centuries, had become a standard form of Eastern monastic observance, an exemplar comparable there to Benedict's rule and its status in the West. 
It is a lifelong desire of Simeon's to serve as an abbot who brings back a lively spiritual discipline to the monastic houses under his control. Many houses at this period of Byzantine life were free to write their own rule, and if the owner of the property was a noble, then that rule could be as pleasant and tax-deductible and uh, retirement-friendly as desired. Simeon wasn't to bring wasn't to bring back to the community the fervor wanted, sorry, Simeon wanted to bring back to the community the fervor of the ancient desert. This was why, undoubtedly, in those early years of his abbacy, large parts of his community rose up in revolt against him. These city monks didn't want to be desert monks. That they could not oust him as an abbot at that moment was chiefly the legal issue that he himself was the aristocrat who physically owned the property. However, Simeon's role as a strong advocate of Cenobitic monastic zeal made him a definite favourite of the Athenite monks who preserved his memory and his manuscripts. But they also noticed something that was distinctive about him as a monastic teacher, namely his stress on the importance of a deep personal attachment to a monastic elder. Simeon made this relationship of a monk to his spiritual father a quintessential element of the ascetical life. Such a dependency was traditional in the early deserts, of course, and then in relation to the life of a hermit who often had a young cell attendant, a synchalos, with him to help with the manual labour, who would then inherit the cave when his old elder died and become an independent hermit master himself. But this whole relationship was something far from common at this stage of Byzantine life, when many of the monks had become largely idiorhythmic, that is, accustomed to doing their own thing. The Greek and Slavonic philokalic revival of the 18th century in the Orthodox world returned to this aspect of hesychastic spirituality with renewed zeal. It was especially notable in the relations of St. Basil of Poyana Maralui and St. Paisi Velichovsky and the circle of the Dobro Tolubie, which then passed on to the Optina hermits and from there to all of Russia, back to Mount Athos and through that on to the modern Orthodox world. In Simeon's hands, spiritual fatherhood means precisely what it says. A monk must seek out a living saint and place his body and soul at his disposal and learn the ways of God from him by means of absolute obedience. That remains a powerful way of spirituality for many monks today living a withdrawn life of ascesis and contemplative prayer. But this idea of spiritual fatherhood has also spread with unfortunate results as a kind of each aspect of orthodox spirituality, where perhaps too many people fancy themselves as a spiritual father or mother and try or even succeed in placing a circle of disciple in forms of unhealthy dependence upon them. Some years ago, the Russian Synod of Bishops actually issued a complaint about how many of its parish clergy were claiming to be young spiritual elders. Certain things ought to be kept in mind in relation to spiritual eldership. The person ought to be, must be, an experienced and very saintly ascetic. That rules most candidates out. Second, anyone who proposes themselves to you as a spiritual father or mother isn't one. Otherwise, they wouldn't propose themselves. Thirdly, such things are meant for those whose discipleship is already so intense that it is beginning to dislocate them from ordinary Christian activity in the parish. Spiritual fatherhood in this sense is not an equivalent to finding a good pastoral confessor, however good that is in itself. If St. Simeon's teaching about spiritual fatherhood has any direct impact on most of us here today, 
it is to insist on his oft-repeated point, that is, sanctity is what we are after, not merely goodness. The saint is who we are each called to be. The existence of a spiritual father, therefore, is primarily cause for the church to celebrate that its living tradition of holiness still remains alive and well. St. Simeon's other great work, of course, as I've said, is his hymns of divine eros. He deliberately used that word and deliberately took the concept of the Byzantine book of secular love songs, usually bawdy in content, and rewrote it as a series of love lyrics to Christ. Of course, he uses a great deal of imagery from the Song of Songs, where his soul is the bride of the beloved Logos, who seeks after him relentlessly. The passion and the lyrical beauty of those songs is intense and gripping. Sadly, the existing English translations did not do justice, either because they did not render from the original Greek or because their own lyrical quality left something to be desired. These are some of the greatest of all poems written in Christian Greek. Simeon knows St. Gregory the theologian well, who was also one of the first Greek fathers to compose intimate poetry addressed to Christ. The most dramatic thing about the hymns is perhaps not the immediately striking accounts they contain of his several luminous visions of Christ and his experiences of the direct touch of the divine spirit which lift him into heights of religious ecstasy or cast him into troughs of deep sorrow when that intimacy is withdrawn, gripping and inimitable though those accounts certainly are. But I think what's more memorable even is rather the way in which Simeon as a theologian consistently stresses that this experience is not for a tiny minority of exceptional saints, but for any human being who wishes to draw near to God in Christ. He brings forward the experience of divine light in his own life as an example of how God desired to draw and desires to draw into close intimacy with a profligate and careless man. And this in turn is offered as a symbol of how God wants to use that man as a prophetic witness that divine union is the vocation of all humanity, however careless or decadent humanity might be. Simeon places two things at the forefront of his theology. First, that a turning towards God must take place in the human heart as a personal choice. This in traditional Christian thinking has been called metanoia or repentance. Secondly, he says that if it is true and heartfelt and passionate, then God himself will be more than ready to respond by offering that soul the direct and high experience of his own close presence. Simeon goes to great lengths to stress this, even to the point that he tells his readers that if they are not certain of having known God by personal, direct and felt experience, aesthetos, he uses the word, then they simply have not experienced him at all. He said this not to discourage believers, but to stimulate them. But unsurprisingly, this worried many of his contemporary hearers, as it struck a heavy blow against formalism in religion, and in particular the implicit supposition that the direct experience of God was something for the past, not the present, or for a few select authorities of ancient times. Simeon's is a rare voice in later Greek Christian writing that is both eschatological and prophetic in character, and profoundly interested in the intimate work that the divine spirit performs within the soul in the course of reshaping it Christocentrically. His sense of the spirit's luminous presence is always attached 
to his consciousness that this is the only power which forms and clarifies the presence of the risen Christ within a believer's most profoundly personal call. For Simeon, repentance is not, as many of the ancient mystical writers tended to put it and would have us believe it, it is not a preliminary stage on the road to a higher union with Christ. Rather, repentance is itself the constant royal highway we must travel all our life long, a life of unending, loving repentance that elicits constantly the tender compassion of an attentive saviour. That personal formation in Christ, Simeon explicitly calls deification by grace, theoipoiesis katacharin. It is his succinct way of re-expressing the patristic doctrines of late antiquity, which is so holistically interpreted, which so holistically interpreted the life and ministry of Jesus in terms of the redemptive incarnation of the divine Logos. For the Greek fathers and for Simeon, the word did not descend to earth simply to forgive the sins of humanity by his outpouring of blood, but rather also to transfigure the dying mortal nature of humankind, of humankind by the vivifying vying power of his immortal resurrection. For Simeon, that transfigurative process occurs as the day-to-day -day spiritual life of believers, their ascetical struggle to sustain morality and love and zeal in a life of committed prayerfulness. Part four, a short epilogue. Evagrius Pontici, who was a disciple of both St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Gregory the theologian, once famously said, if you are a theologian, you will pray truly. If you pray truly, you are a theologian. Like Evagrius, who was one of the most learned men of his age, and like their shared mentor, St. Gregory the theologian, another supremely learned Christian, Simeon the new theologian comes to us as someone perhaps less skilled as an intellectual, but with a heart and a pen blazingly on fire with love, to teach the Christian church in our own time even the very important message that spirituality is not a minor aspect of theology, a subdiscipline, rather that theology is spirituality. In his magnificent writings, the old master teaches us afresh that Christ's gospel comes down to only two clauses. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the other, you must love your neighbour as yourself. Simeon's spirituality is not some privately esoteric mind space. Despite the fact that he saw God as light and was reported himself to have glowed luminously and levitated off the earth on several occasions during prayer, it is rather a spiritual attitude based in humility and repentance, awareness of his limitations, and yet wholly assured and commanding in its assurance of God's glorious resurrection power affecting its outreach to all creation. Simeon makes repentance a joyful affair. From the day in 1975 that I first encountered this saint in the library reading room of Durham University, England, he has been a constant presence in my life. And most recently, I have fulfilled a disciple's duty finally to prepare a fitting translation to his major lyrical opus, The Hymns of Divine Eros, so as to mark, I'm a little bit late, as of March 2022, the passing of exactly 1,000 years since the saints repose at the skit of St. Marina across the Bosporus saints straits from Constantinople. May his memory be eternal. Eonia Imnimi, Veshnika 
Pominire. Thank you for your attention. Father John, thank you so much. Now, Father John has graciously agreed to stay a bit longer and answer some follow-up questions about tonight's lecture. So now we'd like to invite our audience to, to ask them. So you can do that by typing them into the chat box found on the right side of the YouTube page. So I'll be looking through the questions and reading them to Father John as they come in. So any of the folks in the seminary community who are on the Zoom chat are welcome to jump in at any time. Just uh, unmute yourself and ask the question directly. All right, so the first question we have, uh, the, the comment is, this is a fascinating talk. Could you perhaps briefly speak to Simeon's thoughts on the Holy Eucharist? Does he write much about the Holy Eucharist? He, he mentions it um, not extensively, but when he does mention it, it's, it's obvious that it's very central to his thinking. Um, he, he does it in, in um, several different ways. We're told that as a celebrant of the Eucharist, uh, this was the most intense experience of his life. Uh, he doesn't really go into that much himself, but uh, he, he does. Uh, we, we do have that tradition. Um, what he connects with the Eucharist is his doctrine of tears. He sees tears in a quasi-sacramental way uh, as an extension of the metanoia, the repentance grace of baptism, where uh, if the Eucharistic um, bread is, is de rigueur, the, the sacramental presence of Christ, uh, the tears of our preparation are a quasi-sacramental uh, sign of, of the Spirit. And of course, in the uh, Byzantine liturgy, the invocation of the Spirit, the epiclesis, uh, is immensely closely tied to the to the understanding of the uh, embodying grace, the, the embodying power of, of the Eucharistic presence of, of the Lord. So I, I think that both in his doctrine of tears, th this is why he says to, he said to his monks in the early stage, if you don't have tears during your preparation for the Eucharist, uh, you shouldn't go. Uh, th this absolutely outraged the older monks. Uh, of his community and might enrage a lot of uh, orthodox theologians today. But what he's trying to do, uh, and he began to express it more um, uh, politically as, as he got older, of course, is, is to say that um, our heart is being drawn into the Eucharist in the same way that we see the liturgical mystery. By the grace of the Spirit, we are brought into the uh, reality of the Eucharistic presence of Christ. Uh, for a long time, the the prayer of St. Simeon, which is found in the Eucharistic prayers of preparation in the Orthodox Church, uh, was said not to be by him. And I, I think it probably was put together by Nikita Stethatos, uh, a generation after him. He was the abbot of the studium. But I've I've shown in, in in recent studies that almost every line of that uh, modern hymn uh, has been taken from Simeon's authentic writings. It's what we might call a pastiche uh, done by a later hand. Everything in there is is Simeon's doctrine of the Eucharist, and if you know that, and and it's very readily accessible. Um, uh, you, you can get Simeon's Eucharistic doctrine in a nutshell, very, very fervent, very intense um, about the Eucharist as uh, one of the ways we enter into an experience of light and, and love and joy. So, yes, the, the short answer is yes, he's a very important theologian of the Eucharist. Okay, the next one that came in uh, asked, could, could you expand more on the hymns on Divine Eros? How many in the forthcoming book? More about their structure or any other things you can add to your previous comment? Thank you. Um, I could, but I'd probably be going on and <laughs> on. <online>. There's 54 <laughs> hymns 
and we should probably add back the uh, the hymn, uh, which is now orphaned in the preparation prayer book for communion in the, in the, in the Eastern tradition. Uh, the structure is a chaos, and each one is preceded by a one or two line synopsis of what's in the hymn. Uh, none, none of those synopses are, uh, have any bearing with what follows, and they're clearly not by him. They're, again, they're the products of his later disciple, Nikita Stethatos, who was one of the theologians who was uh, responsible for the Great Schism on the Orthodox side in, in 1054. Um, I don't know what was in Nikitas's head. I've tried to get there. He was a very scholastic thinker, but he seems to miss all the important points that Simeon's trying to make. So the best thing would be to forget all of the headings of the hymns and, and make your own synopses. Um, Nikitas decided that he would organize them. And, and again, I, I can't see any process why he put them in, in that order. There, there are several which are letters, original letters, uh, but Simeon has, has stitched them on into uh, poems. Um, I, I think in the edition that the commentary and translation that I've just finished doing, um, I, th I think it is pointless to try and uh, order them. Uh, pr two previous editors in the 18th and uh, 19th centuries uh, tried to reorder them. So we have three editions uh, of Greek, one in a modern Greek version, uh, which all have different enumerations. And we we needed to wait until the Jesuits came along to save us in the Source Chrétien version, um, three volumes of the Source Chrétien dedicated to the hymns of Divine Eros, which gave us a definitive uh, edition and now a definitive enumeration. Um, so I think the quick way to answer a very broad ranging uh, question would would be if it's not too immodest to refer you to an article I wrote uh, about eight years ago in the journal Spiritus um, where the journal Spirit a journal of spirituality a famous journal asked me to give a very short synopsis of why I would say the hymns of divine Eros are a world masterpiece of mystical spirituality, and, and it's titled um, St. Simeon the Theologian, Hymns of Divine Eros, a Neglected Masterpiece. Uh, uh, you, you can find that in a, in a, in a library search, and, and there I more coherently uh, would, would make a case for them. But some of them make one's hair stand up. They're intensely passionate, and, and then some of them are, are, are almost a, a kind of letter telling somebody to to get lost in a big argument. And that person is clearly Bishop Stephen of Alexina. And, and we have material from the trial cropping up, and uh, it, it, it really needed a, a better editor than Nikita Stethatos, and probably a better editor than me. But even so, um, you can see that the, when the saint was getting older and had retired to his oratory in, in exile in Chrysopolis, uh, his spiritual life just became more and more inflamed. And uh, I think a lot of those hymns uh, come from that period. I've suspected, and I've, I've asked other scholars, and there's no commonly agreed uh, common view on this, but Paisi Velichovsky, when he, when he began the Philokalic revival and finally retreated back to Dragomina and then Neamts Monastery in Romania and, and, and set this massive push of the prayer of the heart and the Jesus prayer, the hesychastic revival. Um, he tended to um, sidle away from the official officers of the church and, and um, institute saltiki. The monks would say the Jesus prayer continuously or recite the Psalms as a kind of Jesus prayer alternative uh, rather than going through all of the official offices and uh, 
prayer book prayers. And and that's one of the reasons he, he uh, um, got so much opposition on Mount Athos. And and I think there's a parallel there in, in old St. Simeon that towards the end of his life, I suspect that uh, they were chanting some of these hymns of divine eros uh, rather than doing a, a proper cycle of the offices at, at every point. Um, it tends to be a a movement in in in, in hesychastic uh, fervent spirituality, but there's no common agreement on that point. Okay, we have a few more that came in as you were speaking. Uh, another one asks uh, or makes a comment that the late great Pope Benedict XVI spoke of Simeon's magnificent theology in regards to the Holy Spirit in baptism. Could you maybe touch upon that briefly? He. Um, at, at the time Simeon was writing, uh, a theology of the Holy Spirit had been in profound neglect. Um, I think Yves Congar said the same thing uh, at the time of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, Pope Benedict, of course, had a, a very deep interest in in the Fathers and had read Simeon and, and was deeply moved by Simeon. <clears throat> um, Simeon is one of the rare voices that returns to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It had been uh, a matter of intense debate between the time of St. Athanasius of Alexandria and the Cappadocian Fathers, when uh, it, it was a very important element in building the, the theology, the foundational theology of the Holy Trinity. And the Spirit's role had been assigned to sanctifying power um, and particularly located in the domain of the sacraments and the building of the church. So if you weren't in the communion of the church, uh, de facto you lost the grace of the Spirit. That, that was a very important building block that emerged out of later patristics. And, uh, for example, the role of the epiclesis uh, or in or the spirit's role in baptism and and the Eucharist was heavily emphasized. But after the late patristic period, after really after Cyril of Alexandria with his treatises on the on the Holy Spirit, which have never been translated into English and which no body reads, uh, you can see that a neglect of what the Holy Spirit of God meant in in reality. Uh, set in in the church. And Simeon kind of marks a dramatic explosion at the end of that. He describes the Spirit of God as, uh, of course, all taken from biblical uh, imagery and patristic imagery as a descending fire, but not a descending fire on the apostles, a descending fire upon us, that when the Spirit of God descends into our life, um, it's not like a, a pious devotion. It's like a fireball has come through the roof of the house. The entire house is on fire. There, there, there's no kind of, um, uh, there, there's no dimmer switch on the Holy Spirit of God. This is this is what Simeon is, uh, an immensely impassioned voice. It's undoubtedly why he annoyed so many, certainly Episcopal theologians of his day, and and why he's always was the the darling of the Athenite monks. It's only since the sixties and seventies, really, that Simeon's reputation has spread out from Mount Athos and from the Hesychast monasteries into a much wider uh, lay Orthodox readership. That I think, because the lay readership is now infinitely more educated than it ever was. Uh, they can see the point of what he's saying and are, are not so afraid, um, as, for example, you might find the, the pilgrim in the way of the pilgrim. The poor soul seems to be uh, frightened of his own shadow 95% of the time. Uh, the, the modern lay people uh, are, are more willing to take this uh, and reflect on it and, and see that, indeed, the Spirit of God is the breath of the church. It's the breath of the living being. Um, it's what the ancient fathers said, 
through the Spirit to Christ, through Christ to the Father. But the difference is that um, Simeon's using the monastic tradition says that the way that we breathe that Trinitarian experience today is through our consciousness, our breath, our pnefma, um, becoming assimilated in the spirit to the presence of Christ and through Christ to the Father. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can explain that any more succinctly, uh, not at 1 a.m. in uh, British <laughs> GMT time. Very well, we have a few more here. Um, somebody asks here, as you yourself likely experience in an Anglophonic world, we Byzantine Catholics often are translating our experience, theology, et cetera, into categories of our Western brethren. The papacy of the 20th century emphasized on multiple occasions the Carmelite tradition of spiritual theology. What kind of added balance would you say that someone like Simeon brings in relation to that tradition of asceticism and mysticism? I, I, I don't want to sound um, too broad and sweeping, uh, <laughs> talking about one tradition versus another. I mean, you know, the Catholic tradition of the church is one, isn't it? And and even when you go to Ethiopia and you've, you've never seen or heard any of this liturgical chant before, or, or, or anywhere, Armenia or Georgia, um, Rome, St. Petersburg, Constantinople, you, you immediately sense and know and recognize what the Catholic tradition of the church is. That's true not only in terms of its praying life, uh, its liturgical life, but it, it's true most particularly in terms of its um, interior life of prayer. You, it, it's just recognizable. I, I rest the case that if you don't recognize it, you, you'll disagree with me. But I, I, th I think, as the late Saint Pope John Paul II said, the the, the Church has two lungs, the the East and the West, and and it needs to to breathe with those. I think the Egyptians and the Syrians might say it has four lungs, but you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I know of anything with four lungs that would work as an analogy, but. All the lungs are the same. They're, they're just doing the same function of pnefma, bringing the pnefma in and out in, in slightly different styles. For, for many, many years, for many years, the weight, the, the powerful weight of the ascendant Roman tradition of liturgy, canon law, spirituality, discipline and order impacted itself on 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 a more disorganized eastern christianity um uh, it was disorganized it was old it never changed the light bulbs it never dusted the floor uh, but because of that um it it had kept many deep traditions without necessarily knowing why it had kept them or or, or how they fitted in, into a scholastic pattern, or or maybe it, it couldn't always articulate them. I mean, this this isn't a thing of the the Eastern Catholic tradition only. It applies to the 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 Orthodox Slavs, uh, the Romanian Orthodox. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the Kiev Mohila Academy it was using Jesuit textbooks to formulate its response to the Protestant Reformation centuries after the Reformation had happened. So um, I think the the moral behind it all is that we should have the courage to be who we are. Um, God has opened vistas for us. I was educated by the Jesuits, and I, I'm profoundly grateful for it, profoundly grateful for all of the order and the discipline but you know there isn't just one style of spirituality and in in fact the the typical very discursive structured intellectual meditative type such as so associated with the ignatian exercises is in in many ways a direct antithesis of everything simeon and the hesychastic movement stands for 
Um, I don't think that we should say, well, this we should have this and we shouldn't have that. I, I mean, I, I think people who, especially when people are maturing in, in the spiritual life and have read, uh, I'm thinking of seminarians mm -hmm. and clergy in particular, but, but all people who have, have got a certain level of maturity and a desire to go further in the spiritual life should read and explore. But my advice would be, Keep it to the great saints, you know. We, we we've got more great saints that have been unread. We we don't need new age gurus. We can skip them. We we've got our own tradition, traditions, uh, full of profundity. And sometimes when you get into those traditions, you know that some of them don't fit you. Just like when you go into a clothes shop. You don't want to come out looking like a clown. You, you 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 get things that fit you. Your heart tells you what fits, what doesn't fit. And that's very important in the spiritual life. Abba Anthony said, uh, there are many styles of living, you know, and, and he goes through the various great fathers and patriarchs, how some were hospitable, how some prayed, how some were very energetic and active. And he said, and, and God blessed them to do all those uh, different things in their own different ways and and maybe the church at various times has been too anxious to allow that necessary freedom to happen but so Simeon says if you encounter Christ Christ will lead you um, I can hear people say yes but what if he what if you go wrong and and this is where he balanced it with and and consult a spiritual, elder because the elder will make sure you certainly don't go wrong uh, so there, there needs to be a discipline uh, along with the spiritual and, and intellectual freedom of of the formed mind that's, that's how i would reply okay is there anybody in the seminary community that wanted to jump in with a question at this time Okay, let, let's just do one more. There's a few more in here, but we got to be respectful of your, your time. I know it's late over there in, in, in your side of the, the ocean there. Um, one more question. This is, uh, do you have any thoughts about how to address the seeming anxiety that exists in the present church as it did in St. Simeon's time with regard to the importance of direct experience of God as light? Um. It, it it remains a, a difficult issue. I, I many many decades ago, I was I was lecturing to a group of um, Anglican ordinands and general English lay people in in a British university, and it it was the first time. I think it was the first time that anybody in the theology department of an English university had introduced a, a course on Byzantine spirituality. So I was regarded as a, either something of a nut or an innovator. And in fact, some of the senior theologians of a very reformed Calvinistic type uh, came in to sit in at the back of the room looking disapproving uh, for the first half of the course, just to make sure I wasn't lighting candles or incense or something forbidden. And the time came where we discussed Simeon's visions of light. He has four or five different accounts. And uh, of those four or five, it's he's probably talking about three experiences, which... Um, are stretched into five because he exegetes them in different ways. And one of the things I said was, it's I, th I think it's quite clear from the outset that he's talking about a real experience. It's not a, a trope or an analogy. He actually did see the walls of the building fall away and this immense radiance come and the... the um, unspoken voice and so on. Things that have been spoken of by other Christian saints and and are not. 
totally out of out out of whack with things we know. Um, and we we talked about this, and and I'd put a theological key in that if you want really to see what the saint is talking about, you must understand that he's a monastic abbot giving this talk so that his listeners will take very detailed um, attention to it and put it into praxis. You say, well, what does that, what does praxis mean? Well, praxis means it's going to be the thing they get in the morning discourses and then they think about it for the rest of the day and it shapes their prayer life either for that day or for that month because they go over it again and again and again. And in a very deep way, it, it's meant as a formative talk. It's not. Uh, the other day I was walking down the road and I saw the light of Christ and it was marvellous. And uh, what do you think about that? Um, it's it's not that at all. It, it, it's a formative catechesis for a monk, for an ascetic. Um, so I, I said that the saint is is using biblical code as well as talking about his personal experience. In other words, he's putting his personal experience into a biblical language to give to his monks, and he's using the narratives of the transfiguration of Christ from the Gospels. And and then we had an open, you know, <laughs> then I said to the class, reactions, what do you think of that? And immediately uh, one of the students said, well, there's nothing unusual to that. That's That's how I pray all the time. And fortunately, the bell for the end of class rang at that point, and I said, well, that's very interesting. We'll continue this at another date. And I escaped from the room because I, I, I was I, I was so grateful that the bell had rung because how do you respond to that? You know, was was this a real spiritual experience? Was there some kind of chemical imbalance in the medications? Or what was going on, really? Um, it did not seem a profound spiritual communication to me. Uh, it seemed rather... Uh, let me fly my own flag that, you know, I'm I'm kind of very mystic myself, uh, which had all the hallmarks of big phony uh, to me. So whenever we talk about personal spiritual experience, we have to be very, very careful uh, that this probably only has a transmission uh, effect of about three inches. St. Simeon says that Faith in Christ, the love of Christ, can only be passed personally. And he uses the image from one lit candle to another candle. But before one lit candle can pass it on to somebody else, that person has to have a candle. And that candle isn't, you can't go and buy one at the back of church. It has to be formed, the the, the, the beeswax and the, and the wick uh, are our whole spiritual life, our discipline, our ascesis, our repentance, our prayer, our whole history, the way we've been loved, the way we've suffered, that's our candle. And you, you, you can't go around saying, hey, I've had some spiritual experiences and they're more important than this dozy old parish priest over here or this bishop over there. Um, spirituality isn't like mahjong. Bits and pieces aren't on bits of the mahjong set or dominoes. Uh, it's it's far more organic and, and and chaotic than that. And and I think that's why Simeon insists that this level of spiritual catechesis, this level of spiritual sharing of one experience to another, this formative uh, transmission has to be done in an intensely personal environment, such as an abbot and his monastic disciple. Uh, I'm not sure that I'd like to go on YouTube and uh, talk willy-nilly about um, spiritual visions and uh, the light of Christ and my... Some theologians do, or some people who 
want to tell us that they're doing theology, do that. And um, I, I, I shall desist from speech at this point. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you once again for for taking the time to answer these follow up questions. So we really appreciate it. Uh, so You're now we'd welcome. like to bring. So we're going to bring Father Christian back in for some from closing remarks. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Father John, for your most informative and for me enriching talk about someone about whom I someone I've never really studied very directly myself, uh, and uh, I did know by reputation, as you said, in the last decades that he was becoming an important mystic in the life of the Byzantine Church as far as a contemporary audience is concerned. And obviously, your work at uh, that will be published at St. Vladimir's is, is meant to assist uh, in that becoming more and more the case. Uh, and to everyone that has attended, I'd like to thank you from our seminary faculty, uh, uh, on behalf of our seminary faculty for your presence, I'd like to thank the seminary faculty this evening at the end of our academic year uh, for their devotion to their work uh, throughout this entire academic year. I'd also like to thank you, Ryan, um, who are our technical consultant um, and uh, had so many very and uh, various technical demands in order to prepare for this lecture. To all our viewers, um, in addition to the the thanks that uh, that I'd like to convey to you for your presence and support. If you did enjoy the content of this evening's lecture, do feel free to check out also our uh, academic publication of the seminary, which is available on our website. It's known as the Eastern Churches Journal. You can download a free volume of it at the link, which I believe Ryan will make available to you on YouTube or perhaps um, some other platform if uh, in fact, that is what you're using. You should be able to find it in one of the platforms that we're supporting. I think YouTube is the main one. And it does contain many scholarly articles, not unlike the work of Father John, and is now, again, available for in a complete download at our website. So please do feel free to check that link out, uh, which is now being made available to you. And in addition to my gratitude to Father John for his work and his uh, summary of uh, what his forthcoming work uh, contains, I would ask that God grant everyone here present good health, hope, happiness, and a good night. Christ is risen. Really risen. <laughs>